Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Quick note about the foundation before we begin. We have started on our anxiety and depression uh, literature overview. The premise here is that if you have uh, anxiety, depression, or any related issues with them, or you know someone that does, and if they go to a professional they're likely to know maybe two, three, maybe even 5% of all the possible treatments out there. But what if with a massive literature review of lectures and videos and peer-reviewed papers and interviews, we can assemble, let's say, 20% of all the possible treatments out there? Uh, if, if so, I think it'll be a big home run for the community and for people that need help. So to find out more about this effort, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and uh, let us know if you can help out. All right, today my guest is Dr. Chris Aiken director of the Mood Treatment Center. Uh, he's also editor-in-chief of what's called the Carlat Report, C-A-R-L-A-T. Uh, he's an instructor in uh, clinical psychiatry at Wake Forest University, part of the School of Medicine. So, Chris, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get to the you know the university you're at, and become the director and all that? And, uh, and then I want to go into your current work. I came through this work um, starting out my career working as a research intern at the National Institutes of Mental Health. I had a background in computer science, actually, but I wanted to work with people. I didn't want to just sit at a computer all day the rest of my life. So I made a swap. I said, I'll do your computer work if you teach me psychiatry and got started there. went on to Yale Medical School and then to Duke here in North Carolina for the rest of my training. And I just love it here in North Carolina. So I've settled here the past 20 years. And while I've done that, you know, one thing that's unique about where I practice in North Carolina is that there's not a lot of psychiatrists. So I've gotten to see a lot of people, a lot of patients that I wouldn't get to see otherwise. And I became pretty attuned to something going wrong in the way that we are treating people with depression, something that surprised me. So I took up that and took up some of the research in that, worked with the Harvard Clinic on developing better diagnostic instruments to identify mood disorders more accurately and work with some other people throughout the country to identify better treatments. And a lot of those treatments involve not just medications, but things that people can do in their own lives. Well, what, what kind of conditions are you focused in on? Mainly with mood disorders, which are characterized as bipolar and depression. So there's a whole spectrum between them from what most people think of as bipolar disorder, which we call bipolar one, where people have full manias and full depressions all the way on the other end of the spectrum where people have just depression. And one thing that's interesting is the recognition in the last 20 years or so that there's a lot of people in the middle who have features of both and don't fit nicely into the diagnostic classifications. Well, if you could talk about uh, some of the uh, the mood disorders you see, like what are the characteristics? So bipolar disorder, 
and then depression, like, you know, how do you characterize these various disorders that you see? Well, in some ways, it's easiest to think about these as disorders of energy, not of emotion. You know, all emotions are normal for people. Psychologists have sometimes divided them up into the nine basic emotions, everything from surprise, disgust, joy, sorrow. But mood disorders are really more about the energy, your motivation, your drive. So in depression, that gets turned way down and people don't have any motivation to do anything. They don't feel any urgency to anything all the way up to the manic level where energy and motivation are super fused and people are doing way too much. And sometimes at the manic level, they're doing things that are very productive and colorful, you know, things we might read about in the papers, like having affairs and starting new businesses. But more often, they're just literally going in circles. And we've done studies where we've put Fitbit-type monitors on people with this type of mania, and they just literally run around in circles. They might move all of their furniture from one room to another, kind of meaningless activity like that, random and destructive activity. And But there's also manias where people are very goal-directed, and they will literally change all the decorations in their house and redo it in a way that's very colorful and, and very organized. These episodes where they get into, I don't know, is it called like a mania or they just all of a sudden get focused and they're, they're hyperactively doing a ton of things and you contrast that to the times where they just can't bring themselves to do anything. Is that what this the bipolar disorder nature is? It's everything or nothing. So. I think so. That's well put. And like I said, a lot of people don't have bipolar of any sort. They just have the depressed side. You know, it wasn't actually until 1980 that as a field, we psychiatrists even bothered to separate the two because for a hundred years, people had tried to tease them apart. You know, Jimi Hendrix sings, manic depression has captured my soul. And what does he mean? Well, back then in the 60s, we just called all mood disorders manic depression, whether you were manic or depressed. It was all lumped into one box. In 1980, they tried to split them apart and have call one side bipolar when you got manic and depressed and one side depression where you just got depressed. And what I'm letting you know is what's happened since 1980 is just a ton of research telling us that the separation is not as clean as we'd like it to be. And there's a lot of people in the middle who have depression with maybe some agitation, racing thoughts. They feel kind of wired. They might say they feel tired and wired at the same time. In essence, Rich, there are two opposite forces pulling them apart at the same time, and that creates great anxiety. You know, the, the, the opposite forces don't cancel each other out like we would like them to. So they're pulled in a manic depression. They're driven to do something, and they're pulled in a depressed direction. They don't know what to do. So they have this restless feeling, this anxiety, this constant feeling like something terrible is going to happen. There's kind of an urgency to it, a desperation. And in psychiatry, we call that a mixed state because the two are mixed together. So if you're working with someone that has bipolar depression versus just depression, what do you have to watch out for? What do you have to do to help them You know, between those two different conditions? How different are they? Night and day. It's, it's amazing. And that's what I really changed me in, in recognizing that we weren't treating it right. Because the big difference is that if you're on the depressed side, antidepressants are generally going to help and they're not going to do much harm. There might be some physical side effects, but they're not going to do much mental harm at all. If you're on the bipolar side, an antidepressant, which is what most doctors prescribe for mood disorders, an antidepressant is going to make your mood worse might make you feel even more depressed, more agitated, irritable, anxious, not able to sleep, tired and wired, even full-blown mania sometimes, although that's a lot more rare. So we have to be very careful these days about how we pick who to give an antidepressant to and who to not. Okay, so again, what, what's, what's to be done with people that are bipolar? Do they need two kinds of therapies, one when they're manic, one when they're depressed, or, you know, Hmm. You said the difference is night and day. So what? Let's oh, yes. What's That's a great question. And when I said night and day, I meant the difference between people with just depression and those with bipolar depression. So they have ups and downs is night and day because it makes we use very different medications for the two sides. Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. But to your point, suppose someone does have bipolar of some sort, and there's many different types of it. Then we're really looking at addressing their mood disorder from a different direction. We know two things that are different. One is this is almost always going to be a lifelong condition. We're going to have to use a lot of prevention. And two is that what is driving their depression is what we call cycling. So their mood is cycling like a sine wave going up and down. And we can't just simply stop the depression or we're going to create more mania. So the goal is to stabilize that cycling. Basically, we use mood stabilizers. The oldest of them is lithium, and it's still surprisingly one of the best in the research for a lot of patients. So it still stands out. But in the last 20 years, they've developed a lot of other mood stabilizers that we use as well. So is the does it seem like mood stabilizers help bipolar people? They never get too low. They never get too high. Is that what it does to them or what's the effect? That's a very good point. You know, in some ways, that is the goal with it. But on the other hand, we don't want people to feel what you might call overstabilized. And I see that more as a side effect where if we use too many medications, people might feel sedated. They might not be able to feel their emotions. And I want to get back to that. That's what I started with, that this is not an emotional disorder and we're not looking to treat people's emotions or medicate their emotions. In essence, that's not the goal here. In fact, a lot of psychologists are thinking of mental health. And this is something called the mindfulness direction. For those of you familiar with mindfulness, as the ability to feel and accept all of your emotions. Emotions are very important signals. They guide our decision-making. There are studies where they find stockbrokers who are more in touch with their anxiety, for example, have better returns. Makes sense when you think about it. So we don't want to block people's emotions, and we don't want them to go through their life judging their emotions or thinking that their emotions are off. That's one thing that happens when people come out of mood disorders. They end up second-guessing everything they do, like, I'm really angry at my spouse, but then again, I have bipolar. Should I say anything? And if I do, she's just going to say, did you take your medication? I mean, imagine this, Rich. It's like you can no longer speak up for yourself in the world or express anger without people thinking you're ill or you thinking you're ill. So we do a lot of therapy work around that. And like I said, we certainly don't want the medications to make them feel overstabilized. That would be a side effect if they're suppressing their emotional life. Yeah, once you're labeled as bipolar, you're saying that anything you do, any way you act is viewed through that lens and distorted or, or what do you mean? Very much so. You know, I think that people are treated differently and they internalize that and they see themselves differently. In other words, this is a real, you could say, identity crisis. And here we are as doctors and nurses and therapists giving out this identity and we need to do it very carefully. And I don't think we're doing a good job of that. I think we need to do a better job of explaining to the public and to the patient what this really means, because this isn't really about who they are. Um, there's not a stereotype of who a person with bipolar is. I, I first started my career, I remember seeing um, people who were literally um, quiet librarians with bipolar. And it's not the stereotype at all, right? So it can affect anybody. And it's not a statement about your personality or your emotions. So, I mean, what uh, people that are bipolar, is it more important for them versus anyone that they have kind of a support network of other people like them? Or do they not tend to interact well with each other? Is it maybe, I, you know, I'm not trying to insult I it, think, but does it become a self-absorbed or self-absorbing type of dis disability? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You know, or is the nature of uh, being bipolar is such that it's like a self-absorbing condition where you just don't have room or space to interact with a lot of other people? 
Oh, no, that's a, a great point. And I think it's very helpful, as a, particularly as a starting place. If you're first diagnosed to meet other people with it, it can give you hope that there's a, a road ahead, but that you can recover fully. And that's a unique thing about depression and bipolar. They can expect a full recovery. And there's just a lot of things that go on in your mind uh, that you probably never share with anyone else. So it's helpful to see other people who have similar kind of thoughts and, you know, that you're not alone. I think that's helpful for anyone. Now, to, to your point, it is interesting. We have studies showing that people with bipolar disorder are a lot more extroverted on average than people with depression. So they do tend to have, I, I said that it doesn't tell us anything about their personality and I was somewhat wrong there because the studies we do have show that on average, people with bipolar disorder have actually personal strengths. I'll go over some of them with you. They have greater verbal abilities, so verbal intelligence. They know more words and they use them better. They have slightly better on being warm, empathic, charismatic, you know, things that attract others to you. And they're very able to rebuild their social networks when they collapse, which is one of the most amazing things I see in, in my patients is their whole job and social life and even the city they live in might fall apart, but they'll just come right back and rebuild it again. And they tend to be kind of action oriented. So they, they're forward thinking and move forward and this gets to be sometimes a problem in therapy. You know, a lot of times therapy is built on looking back and understanding the past. And many patients with bipolar want to move forward and build something positive in the future. So that can be a, a conflict there. But when, when, all right, so when bipolar people are in depressed mode, how is that mode different from people that are just depressed? It's practically identical. The only difference we've found, which pretty much makes sense when you think about it, is that the bipolar depressions have more signs that they're biological, by which I mean physical symptoms. So your arms feeling really heavy, your appetite being high or low, you're in your mind, you just literally can't think. You can't go one thought to the next. So your brain is not functioning. Your sleep is really off. Your energy, as I said, is really down. So those symptoms will be more prominent. And those are, psychiatrists call those neurovegetative symptoms. It's one of our fancier words that tells us that there's a strong biological component to this depression. Now, on the other hand, we see a lot of that in people with regular depression. The difference, Rich, is that when psychiatrists use the word depression or in the DSM, major depressive disorder, it's the same thing. We know that that represents a whole lot of people with very different problems. So it represents some totally normal people who went through a divorce and had a bad year. It represents people with long-standing kind of anxious, avoidant personalities where they're always seeing the glass half empty and they easily get into depression. It represents people with late life depression that they were totally fine and it came on when they're 65 and people with a kind of genetically driven or biological depression that comes and goes in waves, but is not a bipolar type. So in many different types within the category of depression, when we talk about bipolar depression, there's not as many different types. I mean, certainly a person with bipolar disorder can get demoralized just like anybody else can, uh, but they're also going to have a lot of these biologically driven depressions that we can recognize. So you, you talked about treatment being night and day. So again, what are some of the fundamental differences in treatment, successful treatment that you observed? Yes. Yeah, so when we talk about medications, it's basically night and day. I'll read some of the mood stabilizers that we use these days just to get, get the names familiar. There's lithium I mentioned, carbamazepine, Depakote, lamotrigine, which is lamictal, lorizodone, which is latuda, quetiapine, also called Seroquel. So there's a, a whole handful of about 15 or so that we use that are mood stabilizers. And these are, they don't have any antidepressant qualities. They do treat depression, but they do not resemble the chemical structure or the chemical effects of an antidepressant. Well, has anyone tried mood stabilizers? I'm sure they have on people that are just depressed. Does it work better or differently for them than uh, antidepressant medications? Well, that's exactly the point that 
people started to make when they tried to split them in two, right? Because um, they did that in 1980, and immediately psychiatrists started arguing back to the DSM creators saying, well, how can you split them in two? There's people, like Rich just pointed out, with regular depression, not bipolar, who respond really well to lithium. I was back in 1980. And now if you look at some of the meds I mentioned, some of them are actually FDA approved to treat regular depression. Like some of the ones that cross both areas are Abilify, Aripiprazole, Quetiapine, Seroquel. These are FDA approved in both disorders. So the answer is yes. And that's part of the evidence we think as to there being an overlap between these two poles of Pure depression, only depression, and bipolar depression. So, what? I mean, are you are you up to date on like the latest and greatest uh, in treating bipolar disorders? What's coming or what's new? Yes, the latest is not always the greatest, of course. And I mentioned that earlier that the old one, uh, lithium, discovered in 1949, continues to surpass many of the others in long-term treatment studies. When we look at people for the long term. Now, that's in a kind of an important distinction because in our country, to get something FDA approved, you only need to do like a six-week study. And once you're FDA approved, you can do all the marketing and advertising you want and just convince every doctor and the whole public that this is the answer for bipolar depression based on a six-week study. We're talking about a condition that affects people for like 50 years, Rich. Like, what is six yeah, weeks? So um, lithium really shows its superiority in the long-term studies. But in terms of what's new, we have lumateperone, which is the brand name is Caplita, and it got FDA approved last year for schizophrenia. And then they found this year that it treats bipolar depression. Right now, the FDA is looking at the papers, and I expect it'll be approved in the fall or winter because I looked at the studies myself, and uh, most of them were positive, I think, enough to satisfy the FDA. That would be the latest. But what's special about this latest uh, drug? What does it do that the other ones don't? In some ways, it's not special at all because it's classified as an atypical antipsychotic. These have been the drugs that have made the biggest splash in the last 20 years as drug companies have gotten them approved for all sorts of things from autism. And in that respect, it actually just treats aggression during autism. You know, sometimes this can be misconstrued as though it's a treatment for autism, but it's really not. Schizophrenia, bipolar, depression. So they're used for a lot of things. They have been highly profitable medications in 2000, I think, 15. One of them, aripiprazole, Abilify, rose to number one as the biggest money-making medicine of the year. And that got me thinking, like, in America, what do you think about that? That the number one profitable medication would be an antipsychotic. Like, what's going on here? Are we all psychotic in America? Like, what is going on here? This is, are things gotten out of hand with this? And so I think they are, bottom line is these antipsychotics are a bit over-prescribed and over-marketed and overused. And lumateperone is going to be one of them. But it is a little different from the others in that it doesn't block dopamine as much. And that seems what that, the bottom line of what that means is it seems like it's going to be better tolerated for patients, which is very important. Yeah, but is it prescribed just for people that are having psychosis or is it probably prescribed for people that are just depressed? Well, you bring up a good point. Exactly. No, I don't mean to say that everybody in America is psychotic because the antipsychotics are going out there. But what I am referring to is that we, we always respected in psychiatry going back to the 1960s and 70s that these antipsychotics are serious medications they're what you might you call heavy duty. You know, they have, most of them have about six or 10 black box warnings of serious things that can happen. You know, we don't like that. I mean, an average medication might have zero or one black box warning. We don't want six. So they should be used for people with serious psychiatric illness is what I'm saying. And people who are not having severe dysfunction from their psychiatric problems it may not be the place to go unless they actually have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, which is where people hear things and see things and get delusional and paranoid, that's what the antipsychotics were developed for back in the 1950s. And until recently, that's what they've always been used for. It wasn't until 2000 that they started to gain all this FDA approval for other conditions. I mean, is there, I'm just making this term up, but is there like drug 
or prescription creep, meaning drugs are approved for X, Y, or Z. But in the field, maybe there's a lot of frustration in treating depression and bipolar disorder, et cetera. And maybe therefore drugs that should not normally be prescribed are being prescribed. That's what I'm making up this term. Do you see that? You must have a hammer because you just hit the nail on the head. So that's right. And I'll, I'll just tell you a story of how that works. Now, in my practice, I no longer allow drug reps into the practice, but I used to and meet with them. And like one of them brought me a study and of an antipsychotic and schizophrenia and said, Dr. Aiken, I just want you to look here at what it did for the anxiety. Just look at that. Now, Rich, we're talking about people with schizophrenia who are paranoid. Of course, it's going to help their anxiety. But what was going on in that conversation? Well, she knew that as a psychiatrist or any doctor, you know, the main thing that doctors treat is anxiety. Why would you go to the doctor unless you're anxious? So anxiety is kind of the catch-all for why people go to doctors of any sort, because they're worried about something. So if you can talk a doctor into treating anxiety, well... You've just got a blockbuster drug. So that is an example of prescription creep. And you can see it in the numbers. You can see evidence of prescription creep with a lot of things from stimulants for adult ADHD. Those have exploded beyond rational numbers in the last 20 years. And even one of the founders of that field, Keith Connors, who died a few years ago, he, at the end of his life, turned against what was going on and stopped giving pharmaceutical-sponsored talks and instead started giving talks on how we need to turn back the tide with all of those stimulant medications that people use for ADHD and people take off-label in a creep kind of way to enhance their cognition. You could classify Ritalin as a nootropic, I guess, but it's really a psychostimulant. It's prescription. It's a controlled substance, a drug of abuse. But I want people to know that, and some of you may have heard this, the journal, I think it was either Nature or Science, one of those top science journals, surveyed their readership as to who is taking psychostimulants to enhance their work and stuff. It was like 30%. Now, I don't think that 30% of top scientists have ADHD. So something's going on there. And you can do the same study with professional chess players, with all kinds of people working at a high level, Judy Garland, Elvis Presley, you know, people have to go on stage and be up and energetic and perform. People with high pressure careers, John F. Kennedy, Hugh Hefner, have for long turned to stimulants to enhance their productivity. Now let's take John F. Kennedy and Hugh Hefner. Both of those men were on stimulants in the 60s, and in both cases, their close cohorts had to grab them by the hand and get them off them because it was making those two people paranoid. And that's one of my biggest concerns with them is uh, they can make people paranoid. Now, another concern, and this is a new study that I think everyone should know about, they found that, yeah, indeed, for a lot of people, these do enhance your cognition the day you take them, you know? Frankly, Rick, if I take a stimulant, I'll probably do a little better on my SATs. But then they looked at it the next day, and they found that people did worse the next day. Well, why was that? Because the stimulant was disrupting their sleep quality. And sleep is what really, the sleep is the best nootropic. That's where learning sets in, whether you're learning a new sport, a new um, musical instrument, or learning textbook stuff. And that's where it, it sets in and improves our performance. During sleep, the brain whittles away memories that we don't need and preserves the ones that we do need. Boy, what could be better than that, right? That's a great mechanism. So we don't want to disrupt sleep. Another study came out looking at the effects of these stimulants. We're talking about amphetamine, Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse in professional chess players. And we knew they were using them. So let's just see what they do. And here's what they found. The... Chess players lost more games on the stimulant. Now, why is that? Like, these are performance-enhancing drugs. What I think happens here is that cognition, you know, thinking abilities are very complex. And it's hard to, for me to imagine a drug that's going to make it better across the board. Usually it's going to change things and make some things better and some things worse. And what was going on here, we know these stimulants can make people a bit, you might say obsessive or hyper-focused, overly detail-oriented, 
kind of self-conscious, second-guessing everything, you're overly attentive. You like have the opposite of ADHD. You, know, you check everything three times. So basically, bottom line is the chess players were losing more games because they spent more time second-guessing their moves on the stimulant. That was the problem. Well, I'm sure there's also a crash where you're depleted of you know X, Y, or Z, and then you feel like crap. And then oh, that I got you. requires right. you to have it again. And so it leads to probably an addictive cycle, is my guess. You sound like you've talked to some people who've taken them because, uh, you know, it's, that's one of the hardest diagnoses for a psychiatrist to make is so called adult ADHD. You know, how many adults think they have concentration problems in this world? And often it's because of sleep deprivation. But anyway, we, we have a very hard time making that diagnosis. So if we do make a mistake and give those patients, say, Adderall, they come back with the kind of story you just described. One is they feel it more as an energy pill, I'll say, than a concentration enhancer. They're not really more organized. They're not getting things done in a more meaningful way. They're just more energized. And then you get that crash where at the end of the day, you feel drained. And then you get that cycle. And then you get tolerance to it. And then after a couple of months, you want a higher and higher dose because it's not working like it used to. Yeah, I think with a lot of medications, you know, like um, natural supplements, I can see why people might think they not work because they're very subtle, but drugs seem like a punch, like, you know, just a really strong punch to the head, but then they leave you hurting later. It's just, well, it's kind of, it seems to be like a universal theme. You know? I, I fully agree with you. And I, I use that analogy of a punch to the head for something that scares me in our work here is, is something called neurotoxicity and neuroprotection. So that's a field that pharmacology is going in, in that we want more medications that enhance neuroprotection. So they help the brain cells repair and grow and strengthen. And I have good news for um, your audience is that nearly every psychiatric medication has been shown to have some neuroprotection involved, particularly lithium, but you know, all antidepressants have, mood stabilizers, many of them have. The ones that have not are mainly the stimulants we just discussed and the benzodiazepines, which are like Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan. So, you know, if you know about these two meds, they are also drugs of abuse. So one thing that stands out in my mind is the way I'm thinking is I'm not just worried about people abusing drugs. I mean, of course, it's on me because I wrote the prescription, right? But they might abuse drugs anywhere. They can get these things anywhere. I'm worried about causing neurotoxicity to people's brains. That's like, as a psychiatrist, the number one thing I don't want to do. The brain is a very delicate organ. That's why it's protected by this big skull. It's the only organ in the body except the kidneys that you can't feel. You know, when you go to the doctor, she's going to stick her fingers up your ribs to feel your liver. They can feel every organ. They can even feel your heart beating there. But your kidneys and your brain, they can't palpate. They can't feel. So if okay, someone so gonna, I see what you mean. It's essential to protect those organs because, again, <clears throat> you're not going to feel anything, and all of a sudden you're going to have a problem. Well, you can't live without them. So you may hear about these really extreme cases where somebody is submerged in a cold lake for hours and they somehow live. Well, basically the body just shunts all blood flow to the kidneys and the brain. Like keep those alive at all costs. Now back to neurotrophics. I have nothing against them. And if I just feel like if we're going to use them, let's make sure that they do good for the brain health long term. For those who are interested in that science, I'll mention a few that fit that criteria. Sleep. Okay. Um, sleep is neuroprotective. It enhances brain growth without sleep or even just leaving the lights on at night. If you sleep with the lights on, it's going to shorten the dendritic spines that are involved in learning and cognition. Imagine that you're sleeping with the lights on and, you know, the light is passing through your eyelids and your brain is not getting the healing that it needs. Mediterranean style diet is highly neuroprotective for a lot of reasons. And within that diet, blueberries, we have the most evidence for, for enhancing cognition. There are now about 12 studies, some done in children, many done in older folks. We're just having the average dose is about half a cup of blueberries a day. And within a month, we can see changes in cognition and brain function in a positive direction. You could possibly add dark chocolate to that list as well. Although dark chocolate, you know, there's some risks there for your teeth, for if you have reflux. 
sugar, diabetes, but there's a lot of good in that dark chocolate as well. So what, what do you see as, um, I don't know, besides just a new drug, a new drug, is there anything in the near term future of depression that uh, you think will be very helpful? Yeah. So back to what brought me into this field, that's part of what inspired me was realizing that increasingly as I trained in med school in the 90s, I was realizing that we're entering this kind of pharmaceutical way of thinking about all our problems. Like I've got a problem, there must be a drug for that. And that goes on, Rich, whether you have mental illness or not, you know, Um, people with schizophrenia feel that way. Everyday people feel that way. They're looking for that solution. And obviously I prescribe medications all day. I have nothing against that solution, but I just felt like we were losing track of some of the other things we can do. And I want to empower people to take a more active role in their life and not not just feel like medications are the only solution they have. So the things I'm talking about, I'll, I'll go over today, uh, they largely don't have any funding behind them. For many of them, the science is just about as good as what we have for medications. And The effect in the study, one thing we look for in medicine is called the effect size, which is basically how much better than a sugar pill is it or a fake treatment of placebo. And we want things with a big effect size where we can see a difference. So when it comes to lifestyle interventions that have a big effect size, talking about aerobic exercise 30 minutes a day and the Mediterranean style diet, both of these have effect sizes that are equal to or surpass antidepressants. And they're better than antidepressants in other ways, like they help cognition and concentration, and they help sleep and they help your physical health. So those are pretty well known. You know, I think people know that the Mediterranean diet is healthy, and there's lots of resources online for that. It basically involves eating a lot of vegetables and fruits of different colors, particularly berries are good for the brain, and dark green vegetables like kale and broccoli and spinach. And eating a lot of nuts, just a variety of nuts. There's no, you know, some people say uh, almonds or walnuts are the best for the brain. They're just the most studied, but probably the key is getting a variety. The brain looks like a walnut. (laughs) It sure does. You're right. It looks just like a walnut. It's a a mini brain. It's funny. Yeah, that is true. And more fish, lean meats, and all that's kind of pretty obvious as a standard healthy diet. There are two things. I went on this diet myself when I learned about it five years ago, there are two things that were new to me. One is changing all of your oils and butters to extra virgin olive oil. And this is the extra, and the extra virgin has extra ingredients like polyphenols that help protect the brain. You can think of them like antioxidants and vitamins. And one myth about that is that you can't cook high heat with extra virgin olive oil. Well, I've seen some new studies where they've compared them to other oils and extra virgin actually comes out better because it has those extra antioxidants in it. It's less likely to degrade under high heat. It has the protection built in. So switching out the extra virgin. And the other thing that was new to me was switching all of your carbs to 100% whole grains. Now, a couple of things about me. I, I didn't know anything about nutrition when I went on this. So... I read that and I thought, well, bread is bad for you. So they must be just doing that as like a lesser of evils. But no, whole grains are so good for you. They prevent diabetes. They have many benefits beyond the brain. It's not just a lesser of evils. You actually want to eat whole grains. And the other myth is just that there's a lot of products out there that advertise as like made with whole grains, wheat bread, multigrain. And none of these are any good. That just means they sprinkle in a few whole grains and the rest of it is enriched, stripped away junk. Um, so you want it to say 100% whole grains or the first ingredient should be whole wheat or whole corn or whole whatever grain it is. Some of them have an orange stamp that says whole grain council which is nice, but otherwise there's no real official labeling, unfortunately. So like some, to do that, you can substitute your pastas for 100% whole grain, your white rice for brown rice, and popcorn, if you make it at home, as healthy as 100% whole grain. You can get crackers, bread, cereals, um, a lot of pancake mixes out there, 100% whole grains. Anyway, the bottom line with these things, I think most people know that fruit is healthier than fruit juice, right? Because 
fruit juice is stripped away of a lot of the fiber and nutrients and you're just getting the sugar. So it's the same analogy here. Regular bread is stripped away of a lot of the good stuff and just left with the bad stuff. Whole grains has the whole thing. And extra virgin olive oil has the whole thing. It's not stripped away of the good stuff. I went on this diet I said about five years ago and I just did it as an experiment to like know what my patients are going through. And right. I'll tell you, I can't get off it now. Like it's, that's a side effect. Like I love Chick-fil-A sandwiches, Rich. I can't, can't have them now. I feel sick if I have them. So it actually changes your body. What I didn't know about that. I thought I'd just try this out. So now I'm stuck with it. And I go out like today, I went to this wonderful breakfast place. I would have loved the chicken and waffles, but I had to get the whole grain salad because I know how I'm going to feel three hours later. Now, one way that it changes you is it changes the the microbiome, billions of bacteria in your gut. And that's been another area of new directions in mental health from anxiety, depression all over, is understanding that a healthy microbiome is going to secrete chemicals that are absorbed into the system and then communicate through the vagus nerve with the brain and through the inflammatory system that make us less depressed less anxious and better concentration and less tendency to crave junk food and be obese. And an unhealthy microbiome, which happens when we eat too much of the Western style diet. So we're talking here, the things you want to avoid on this Mediterranean diet, we're talking simple sugars, fried foods, processed foods, fast foods, sweets, and simple carbs. When you eat too much of that, you get a less diverse and less healthy microbiome. And they secrete the opposite chemicals. They secrete chemicals that make you more inflamed and more wanting to crave junk food, the stuff that they want to eat, right? So you're actually, if you think about it, the bugs in your stomach are making you want to eat the stuff that they want to eat, like McDonald's. If you've seen the movie Super Size Me, you know what I'm talking about. That guy had depression after a month of that. That gets to two areas of where we're making new discoveries Rick, is um, inflammation. We're finding that 30% of people with depression have a strong degree of inflammation causing the depression. So what I mean by that is there's inflammation in the body, which is what happens when your body's trying to fight off infections and stuff, fight off bad stuff. After COVID, the long post-COVID syndrome is one example of inflammation. But even before COVID, we knew that 30% of depressions have a lot of inflammation. And now we're trying to develop anti-inflammatory therapies, medications, in fact, that can cut through that. But right now, the thing that's most successful for inflammatory depression is what I just said, anti-inflammatory lifestyle, which is aerobic exercise and Mediterranean. And you can take a probiotic. There's about 30 or so studies showing that that does improve anxiety and depression. So that can be helpful as well. But probably you're going to need to, if you swallow that probiotic, you want it to have a good place to land. So you want to have a good garden, a good array of, of um, what they call prebiotics. Prebiotics are basically the foods that healthy bacteria like to eat. So fiber, for example, the stuff in the Mediterranean diet, nuts and berries, you want that in there so that they have a good place to land and they can thrive. Right, well, very good. Chris, so what, what's the best way for people to find out more about your practice? And I don't know what areas you serve or don't serve in telemedicine, but uh, again, what, what are some resources for listeners? Circadian rhythms. And we're, we're finding that both bipolar, mainly bipolar, but also regular depression are highly driven by abnormal circadian rhythms, the 24-hour cycle. And we're finding that's really important to everyday health as well. So I've taken that on in my life. I don't have bipolar depression, but it helps me function better. And what that means, to put it simple, is having bright light in the morning, so outdoor light or even a, a light therapy like a dawn simulator that turns on a gradual sunrise in the morning. These help depression. And total darkness at night, which we don't have because we have so many blue light emitting devices at night from iPhones to laptops to even Energy efficient bulbs emit a lot of blue light. So we have our patients wear these orange glasses that filter out a hundred percent of blue light and they put them on about two hours before bed. The result is they sleep deeper. If they sleep in a pitch dark room, especially they wake up with better energy and concentration and less depression and a lot less bipolar. 
Now, I started wearing them, and when I don't wear these glasses, people tell me I'm more irritable, so something must be going on with them. And a lot of sports teams are wearing them as performance enhancing in a way because, you know, that deep sleep improves your sports performance. So your question of, of where to find all this stuff, if these are things you want to put into your life, uh, the place to start is psycheducation.org. And that's a nonprofit website that I created with a psychiatrist, Jim Phelps. And Jim Phelps helped develop these what we call dark therapies, these orange glasses that trick the brain into thinking they're in pitch darkness and help people sleep better at night. So we have a lot of information there and we have resources there about where to buy these products on Amazon. You know, there's a lot of blue light filtering glasses out there. It's getting quite popular, but most of them are not blocking 100% like people need. So there's only a few that really do that. Well, very good. Well, Chris, thank you for coming on the podcast. You've had a lot of resources. We've covered a lot of ground and uh, thank you. All right. Thank you, Rich. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.